Squirrels. Ever heard of them? They may seem cute with their bright colors and bushy tails, but there's so much more going on than you might realize. For example, where are all the baby squirrels? Like, they've got to exist, right? But you never see them. Like, you never see them. But then where do the adults come from? You see what I'm saying? So, it, it, never mind, that's not what I'm here to talk about. No, I'm here to talk about the constant struggle, the conflict, the hunt for nuts. That's right, walnuts, chestnuts, acorns, and pecans. Or pecans, if you will. It's a constant battle for provisions, scouring the forest for the nuts you need and getting them where they need to go. But the other squirrels aren't your only concern. The fox is constantly stalking through the woods, disrupting your supply lines and generally being a total wad. But if you can outfox the fox and outforage your fellow furry friends, you might just win the nut hunt. Hey folks, my name is Shay Parker and this is RTFM, the show where I teach you how to play a game. And today we're learning Nut Hunt, because just like the fox in this game, I never really got over the joy of chasing squirrels around a park. This game plays one to five players in about a half an hour, more at higher player counts. You'll play as a scurry of squirrels, and yes, that is the group noun for squirrels, and I love it, and you'll be collecting nuts, recruiting more squirrels, building nests, and trying to stay one step ahead of the fox that is intent on ruining your plans. Now, before we get started, I want to mention two quick things. First off, this video is commissioned by publishers, Pine Island Games, so big thanks to them. And second, while I don't expect to get any rules wrong, if I do, I'll be using the Klingon subtitles channel to post any corrections, so please turn those on or check the description box below. And with that out of the way, let's learn how to play Nut Hunt. So first things first, we have to create the wilderness that our squirrels will call their home. Take all of the location tiles and randomly arrange them in a big hex like so, with each tile oriented the same way and the compass tile nearby. Place the nut decks nearby as well, face up, along with the objective deck which goes face down. Place the fox in the center and deal everyone three secret objective cards, of which they'll keep two. I'll talk more about those in a bit. Each player gets a bunch of squirrels and nests in their player color, after which you'll determine a first player and place your starting pieces. In turn order, you'll place one squirrel on a green bordered space, after which you'll take two nut cards of your choice among the options on the tile. So if I place it in my favorite Nickelodeon game show challenge, The Crag, I can take two walnuts, two acorns, or one of each. Each player will do this in turn order, but you can't go to a place that's already occupied. Then you'll do it all again in reverse turn order, after which everyone will have four nuts and two squirrels on the board. Oh, and there's a special rule if you're playing with five players, just check it out if that's the case. Once that's done, you're ready to start. Nut Hunt is played over a series of turns that involve moving the fox, potentially scattering the squirrels at encounters, foraging for nuts, and then performing one of three optional actions, recruiting squirrels, scouting objectives, or hassling the fox. If you collect enough squirrels together, you'll build a nest, which is good for a few reasons, but one of the big ones has to do with those objective cards you start with. Each of these lists two locations and a point value. Your goal here is to have a connected chain of squirrels and at least one nest between these two hexes at the end of the game. If you do, hooray, points. If you don't, tragedy, negative points. So when choosing your objectives, try to keep ones that work well together. Also, if a player builds four nests, the game will end pretty much immediately. But in order to get to that point, let's talk about all the things you do in a turn. So we want to create this conga line of happy little squirrels, but that's not entirely up to us. Like I said, the first thing that happens on each player's turns is that the fox is going to move. You determine the direction by rolling a die and matching the number to this smug fox and its compass. And do you know why they look so smug? It's because they're about to scatter your squirrels. You see, each time the fox enters a space with any squirrels, you must move them to an adjacent location, not including the space the fox just came from. If multiple player squirrels are scattered, the active player will go first and you'll continue in turn order. And if you're scattering more than one, they don't have to go to the same place. Oh, and one quick thing, if the fox were ever to move off the map, it bounces back from the edge like a pro wrestler and moves in the opposite direction. Now this might be inconvenient or advantageous to your overall plan, but there's one guaranteed good thing that comes from the fox's movement, and that is foraging. In the same way as we did during setup, every time the fox moves, the active player gets to forage from the space it moves into. I don't exactly know how that works, maybe there's some collusion going on between the fox and the squirrels, but regardless, you get to draw exactly two nut cards matching the options on the location. Speaking of, let's take a closer look at these tiles. As we've seen already, these green locations will show one or two nuts available, as well as a cost on the right side which has to do with recruiting squirrels. More on that in a moment. 
There are also black locations, which function pretty similarly, but keep in mind that the numbers on the right don't have anything to do with foraging. You still only ever get two nuts after a fox moves. There are also locations that can get you any type of nut, and two locations with limitations on movement. The frog pond is off limits for squirrels. The fox knows how to swim, so it might go there, but no squirrels can enter this space by any means. And then there's the pine barrens, which you can scatter into, but you can't recruit there. And since I keep mentioning recruiting, let's take a look at that next. After the fox moves and you forage for nuts, you can take one of three actions. Recruit a squirrel, hassle the fox, or scout an objective. Starting with the first one, you can recruit a squirrel in any location except for those two we've mentioned and wherever the fox currently is. Once you pick a spot, you need to pay the cost shown on the bottom right. So the tangle here needs one acorn and one chestnut, whereas the fairy ring next to it needs three nuts of any type, so long as they're all the same. And even if you have a whole handful of mixed nuts, you can only recruit one squirrel when you take this action. Also, as a free action, you can trade three matching nuts for one nut of any type. Now, getting squirrels onto the map is useful, not just to help make those pathways you're going for, but also to build nests. See, if you ever have three squirrels in one location, even if it's not your turn, they must immediately become a nest. And when you build the nest, the noise of all that construction scares off the other squirrels in the location, and they'll need to scatter just like if a fox walked in. As usual, you can't scatter into the frog pond or the location with the fox. Now that fox is a nuisance, but you can use it to your advantage and get some petty revenge with the next action, hassling the fox. This lets you lure it into an adjacent location where you have at least one squirrel or a nest. You have to scatter in exactly the same way as before, but you'll get one extra nut from the space the fox moves into. And remember, you choose where your squirrels scatter to, so this could be a way to get a new nest without recruiting. Now nests are fixed locations, so they never scatter. Also, multiple players can build nests in the same location, and a single player can have multiple nests there too. You probably don't want to do that, but you can. Now, if you end up building a nest in the middle of a scatter, and that causes a second scatter, resolve the new scatter first, and then go back and finish the original one. Now, the last action is to scout an objective. To do this, you draw two objective cards and can keep one of them or discard them both. This is a great way to score extra points, but any objectives you keep that you don't score will lose you points, so grabbing more can be a bit risky. Anyway, after you've taken your optional action, the next player in clockwise order will take their turn, again starting with fox movement. And like I said, once a player has put out their fourth nest, resolve any scatters that that triggers, potentially making more nests for other people, and then the game is over and it's time to count up your points. So let's cover that next. So once the game has ended, it's time to count up scores. And that comes from two places, your nests and your objectives. Each nest you put out is worth two points, easy. The objectives are a touch trickier. In order to complete an objective, you need to have an unbroken chain of squirrels and or nests between both locations on your card, and there must be at least one nest in there. If you have that, you'll gain the points shown on the card and potentially a little more based on how far away those tiles were. To determine that, trace the shortest possible path between the two points, regardless of how you actually got there. Then add a point for each tile in between your start and finish. So here, even though we had this silly winding path, we're only going to get one extra point. And then of course, you have to count the objectives you didn't score, which will net you negative two points for each. Add this all up, and whoever has the most points wins. If you're tied, whichever tied player built the most nests will win, followed by most squirrels on the board. And if that's still a tie, you share the victory and, presumably, the nuts. So that's all you need to know to get started, but there are a couple gameplay variants that I want to cover as well. The first is an optional rule that you'll want to use if you're playing two-player, or if you want the game to be a bit more competitive, and it goes like this. Whenever you build a nest, before scattering, each other player with a squirrel in that location returns one of them to their supply. This can get a little hairy in a high player count game, so it's not recommended for your first play, but feel free to add it in when you're ready for a toothier experience. The other variant to talk about is how to play the game solo. For the most part, this has you following the same rules, but playing against an AI opponent, who I'm choosing to call Andrea because I don't know how to pronounce Atoma. Atoma. Whatever. During setup, first place your two squirrels, foraging as normal, then draw Andrea's starting hand. Depending on whether you want the game to be standard, advanced, or expert difficulty, this will be two, three, or four objective cards, which you'll place face up near the board. Place one of her squirrels on each start and end point of these objectives, unless the fox is occupying one of them. Once you've set up, you'll take the first turn, and for you, gameplay is the same as how it always is. If Andrea ever needs to scatter her squirrels, roll a die to determine where each one goes. 
If this points to an ineligible location, roll again, or if it points to the edge of the map, move in the opposite direction just like the fox. Other than that, everything's the same, and Andrea's squirrels make nests the same way yours do. On her turn, however, things go a little differently. First off, the fox doesn't move at all. Second, she only ever takes one action, drawing an objective card and recruiting a squirrel on each location shown, unless the fox is there. Then discard the card, and now it's your turn again. Play continues until the game ends as normal, and Andrea uses her starting hand of objective cards for scoring. And that's all you need to know to play Nut Hunt. Thanks again to Pine Island Games for commissioning this video, and to all of you for watching it. Happy hunting, and I'll see you next time. Bye.